All right, so let's start with going over with the questions that we left off with. Uh, we were going over 1984B, and from our uh, data given to us, our experiment, we came up with the orders x to the 0, y to the 1. That should be no problem. We calculated the rate constant with the correct units. Molarities cancel. We had s to the negative 1. Okay. So first order reactions, S negative 1 is going to be your unit, but it's going to change depending on first, second, and um, 0, first, or second. And again, you can just solve for it. I'm solving for K. I'm plugging in the values from one experiment. Pick one that you want. Okay. Put the rate in from that same experiment, the X, solve for K. Okay. And you get your value to the correct units. This is important. This is free money. They give a point for the value and a point for the right unit. So that's an easy two points. Now number C is where we were starting to use for the first time our integrated equations. Okay. Now this is a nice little question here that's a very typical one and I would say one of the hardest ones you can see. So it's very doable. How long must a reaction proceed? How much time does it take for a reaction to get to the product to equal a certain value? And that is integrated formula. Okay. We're not talking about initial concentration, initial point. So we want the Z to get to 0.2 molar. If the reaction concentrations initially for X are 0.8 molar, for Y, 0.6 molar. And of course, Z0 zero is 0 molar because you're starting from scratch. Now, I have a stoic table here that I built. And it's very helpful to do that. 2X, Y, and Z, of course, that comes from the balanced chemical formula above. Okay, And that's very important because we use that for sometimes for the stoichiometry or for the rate of decrease and other questions going to come up that we started talking about. So we started with these initial concentrations. We have no Z because it hasn't reacted yet. We know that this because of the stoichiometric relationship, minus 2x, minus and plus x. So we're going to lose some to gain. Now, they said when Z is 0.2. So gosh darn it, that plus x is going to be 0.2 because it started at 0. So that's the ice table. Okay, So that's going to be 0.2. So if plus x is 0.2, then this has to be minus 0.2, and this is 2 times minus 0.2. So you're going to take this final value, which will be 0.6 minus the 0.2 is 0 0.4, 0 0.8 minus 2 times 0.2, which is 0.4, is half. So now you know your concentrations of your reactants, okay, when your, concentra when your uh, concentration of your reactant gets to that value. And of course, if you know that, you can solve for T. Now we know from the beginning, um, we determined that the re reaction order was overall 1. So because it's overall 1, I'm only considering Y. Now some people have asked me, what if you had another 1 here? Then that reaction order would be 2. But let's make this very, very clear. The integrated formulas they give you in your reference table, okay? And I'm going to go there now. Okay, so I'm at the reference tables, and you can see that we've been using these thermochemistry and kinetics place here. This is the gas laws here. But here we had the kinetics of all this stuff that we used. A couple of these we're going to pick up with uh, our redox. So we're almost done with these. And we have these three equations. And as I derived last night the zero order, uh, I'm going to make separate videos for the derivation of the uh, first and second, but this is the first and second order as listed as I talked about in my form. So these are listed for you, okay? So this is the first one, so this is the first order, and this is the second one, okay? This last one links the rate constant with activation energy and temperature and concentration. Okay, so we're going to talk about this one in this today's lecture, too. But in any case, because it was first order, okay, we use this one. But again, I want to make very clear that the first order, this is the derivation if your rate, okay, is equal to K of, let's say, X to the 1. Okay, I don't know what just happened there. Of 1 power. So what I mean by that is um, if... And that doesn't come into play except for like number two. Number two, this, this is the first order, okay? This is the second order integrated equation. What I mean by all that is 
if um, this second derivation or this second solution to the integral is when you have a rate order of k to x squared. So the reaction order is 2. Okay, It does not um, mean you have an x to the 1 and an x to the 1. Okay, believe it or not, it's a different derivation. So the ones they give you, okay, are for those particular scenarios where you have in a reaction, like one here, you have an x by itself, or the y in the case that we have, one of them is zero. Okay, here it's the case where you have a 2x, okay, and something's a zero or by itself. So those are the cases that you have, but it's very easy to remember. And as I said before, that's your y. This becomes your plus value to be your, um, what can I say, the um, y-intercept. And there's your negative slope for first order, positive slope for second order. Okay, good stuff. Let's go back to the page. Okay, so here we go. So back to the problem at hand. So once we figure out our stoichiometric relationships by just using our um, values of the coefficients, we know that when we get to a z of 0.2 molar, x has to be 0.4 and y has to be a 0.4. Now, this is a first order reaction, so which one do we use? Well, we use the one that's the first order. As we said before, okay, you came up with zero for an x. So x's concentration change will not affect the rate, so we're only going to be evaluating y in this formula. So no problems. So we're going to put um, the concentration of y at some time period that we're trying to solve for, and that of course is going to be 0.4, that's why that went there. We're going to subtract, uh, of course we got this from the reference table, the first one, the uh, a at initial, or y in this case, of initial concentration, which in this case was 0.6, a negative k you solve for here, and we solve for t. Okay, subtracting these two is really divided by, okay, those two values, so the lin of 0.4, lin of 0.6, find those numbers, and you're dividing by because you're, you're minusing exponents, you're taking them out of an exponential and into a real number, okay, and you solve for t, okay, and you get 58 seconds. Not very hard, but you can guess, you can get lost along the way if you don't understand what's going on here. They gave you values to get, okay, to what it would be, these values would be when this concentration gets to you plugged in knowing it was first order picking the right equation and knowing that this is initial concentration of y y is the one that's the first order and this is the uh, of course the concentration of y at some time period or in this case 58 seconds okay moving on to the next one calculate the rate of decrease anytime you're calculating the rate of increase or decrease this is a stoichiometric relationship now if you can use Differential is great, but you don't got to go that route. I know the rate from experimental one, the rate of formation of Z is 7.0 times 10 negative 4 molars. Now look what I'm doing here. I'm timesing by 2 to get the uh, increase from X. Now why am I doing that? Because there is a stoichiometric relationship again. Okay, if you think with me for a second, there's a 2X going to an X. So how would we say, look at 2X. We know the value of z, okay, right here they give us the rate of formation of my product, okay, so what's the decrease of x, because x is your reactant, it's a 2 to 1 relationship, if every one of these is 2 of these, so whatever z decreases, I'm sorry, for every how much z increases, x doubles in its ability or in its decreasing, I'll say that again probably a little better. For every amount of z, or for its rate of increase, x increases twice that, x decreases twice that amount. Okay, so the rate of decrease of x, as we lose it to go forward, okay, its rate of decrease is twice the rate of increase of z because of the 2 to 1 relationship. And you don't have to do everything that I did in the bottom here to get to that point. But that's, I'm showing you how to do it. 2x to z, 2 times x. You can use these fancy, fancy differentiated formulas, okay? But essentially, you're just doubling that, okay? Twice the amount of x is lost per the production of z. Easy for me to say, but 1 half x over t equals this, okay? Many ways to do that. Hopefully, you can see that. It's just a stoichiometric relationship. Okay, last question here. 
was select the mechanisms below, okay, or select from the mechanisms below the one that's most consistent with the observed data. Now, the observed data gave me a first order for the y and a zero order for the x. So if I look at number one, this is the slowest rate determining step. That would mean that x and y, both reactants, with a coefficient of one, this would be the elementary step, these would have to be one to one. Remember, the coefficients equal the exponents only if you have one step or if that step is the slowest. We look right at the slowest rate determining step, so the rate law comes right from this elementary step and the coefficients would equal that. Well, we know that x goes to zero power, so that's why number one cannot be used. Number two, we have that fast equilibrium. That would mean that the formation of M, the intermediate, okay, is equal to the loss or the rate of X, two X's. And to do this, I show you my equation here, but I can just evaluate because the rate of the forward equals the rate of the reverse, the, you can solve for the concentration of M, okay, like I did here, equaling these two X's. So M equals two X's. These two X's could be plugged in for M in this position. Okay, and you get what? Y, I'm doing it right here, and the two X's. This would give me, okay, a third order reaction, an overall reaction of third order, two plus one. Well, we don't have that. We have X to the zero order. Okay, remember, we're evaluating M. We can't have M. This is the slowest step. So intermediates are not going to be in the rate law. So we quantify them in terms of a reactant. Well, because of the fast equilibrium, we can do that very, very easily. Okay, these two x's go right here. So third has to be the answer. Slowest step is the first. That means y has a coefficient of one. Notice x is not in the slowest step. So that's what gives it a rate order of zero. You still need it for the reaction to go. But changing its concentration doesn't change the rate because it's not involved in the slowest step. Many ways to say that. You can look this over at your earliest inconvenience, but that explains that. Okay, so we have really one last concept, and that is uh, catalysts and activation energy, which is affected by both. I guess there are two concepts. So I'm going to take you through the PowerPoint for a little bit, and we're going to go there next. Okay, so one of the last concepts here is something called how activation energy is affecting uh, and how it relates to the rate law constant. And we've talked about Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions already. We know that temperature is defined as the average kinetic energy of molecules of a sample. And at any temperature, there's a wide distribution of kinetic energies. Now, they have this E of A line right here. This represents activation energy. This is the line that shows you that in a full range of molecules, you only have a fraction of them have enough kinetic energy by random distribution that are above this line that have the energy to overcome okay, uh, forces of attraction or to overcome repulsions to form a chemical reaction. So given the uh, kinetic energy or temperature, there's only a few particles that have enough energy needed for reaction. That's the activation energy. And we looked at that last year as um, last year activation energy is from when, you, from when you start of a reaction to the top of the hill. Remember that? This is the activated complex, the change of E or enthalpy if we have what? constant pressure and temperature there. Okay, well, it's the same thing. It's activation energy. Well, at a certain temperature, there's a range of chemicals, a range of, a range of um, motions, and some are beyond that point. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, how does that affect K? Well, understanding this, as temperature increases, okay, you can see there's more molecules have a great enough activation energy. That's why temperature affects the rate of reaction. Now, also, temperature affects the value of K, because the rate constants are dependent upon temperature. All right? So, of course, as you get to higher temperatures, there is more molecules that have enough activation energy. You don't need me to tell you that. That's pretty basic stuff. All right, here's a pretty interesting diagram here. And here is the activation energy of 1 and the activation energy of 2. With a higher activation energy, there are less molecules. So if you change the activation energy from a high to a low, you're going to have more molecules. All right? So there's a lot of stuff going on here. And, of course, this is the distribution of molecules at temperature 1. It's colder. 
then of course at temperature 2. So let's look at e when EA1 for a second. At temperature 1, you have that small fraction. But at higher temperature, you've got a lot more molecules. Now, if you were able to increase the activation energy, increase that threshold, that barrier, okay, you can see that you have a lot less. So for a larger uh, activation energy, a small fraction of molecules has an E greater, okay, than the EA. So at higher temperatures, more molecules have a uh, activation energy than their initial, okay? Now, um, given all that, how do we determine um, this, this type of distribution and changes? Well, we have an equation that was built by Arrhenius, and we're going to get to that now. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here, okay, is that K, which is equal to the rate constant, how fast the reaction will go, has some value with K. You know that R equals K times whatever factor. So as K increases, so does the rate. Now, how is K affected? Well, K is affected by the activation energy. And if we were to take an activation energy that is higher, that's EA2 here, this green line, and we were to lower the activation energy, we would clearly have more molecules that have enough activation energy to start the reaction. And of course, the K is larger. The rate constant has to be bigger. Now, if you increase the, um, or somehow the reaction has a larger uh, activation energy, okay, we know that it decreases the amount of uh, uh, molecules that can actually um, uh, have enough kinetic energy to do that. So, so activation energy is tied to kinetic energy. And also, I'm sorry, tied to um, e the K constant. So activation energy, the amount of it for reaction, is definitely tied to K. L uh, a lower activation energy has to give me a higher K. More molecules can react, therefore it'll be faster. Now, temperature is also involved. K is temperature constant. If you increase the temperature, okay, keeping EA constant, let's deal with it. So I have T1 here, and EA1 is my activation energy. Well, if I increase the temperature to T, uh, T2 here, that's this curve, you can see there's a lot more molecules that have enough kinetic energy to, over, uh, to overcome the repulsive forces of the electrons, or bond energies, whatever you want to call activation energy, the amount of energy it takes to start a reaction. But we have more. So as temperature increases, okay, we go from this little bubble pushed up against absolute zero, it flattens out, and we have more molecules that have the energy to react, so they react, and K increases. So temperature increases must be associated with a change in K. All right, well, we have a formula, or we have, let's say, a equation that talks about that. All right? And uh, the Boltzmann distribution is what we just did here. So we're going to move this line. We can either move this line for the reaction to change K, or we can change the temperature. So reactions rates increases as the temperature increases, or the activation energy decreases to give you more molecules. Okay? And there is a fraction of molecules that was found, okay, I believe it's through um, something called Savant Arrhenius as part of this. The fraction of molecules, okay, that have this energy is given by this equation. So the fraction of molecules that have, okay, the um, energy to start a reaction, which is equal to or greater to the activation energy, is equal to this activation energy over the gas law constant in joules times temperature in Kelvin. All right. Uh, moving forward, we have the Arrhenius equation that takes in this fraction and times it by A. A is called a frequency factor, but uh, what A really is, okay, is the amount that the K would be if all the molecules had uh, the activation energy needed. So A is the equivalent of K if every single molecule had the energy to become a, uh, to exceed uh, EA. That would mean this activation energy from previous graphs would be all the way to the zero line. So this 
is the fraction of all molecules that have or are better than activation energy. And this value, called the frequency factor, is what K would be. So when you times this by the fraction, you get what K is. This is pure K if every single molecule had the energy to uh, react. And this is the fraction that actually do. So what you're doing is you're finding a percentage of what K is. And you can see clearly that temperature plays a role. Okay, look at the negative EA here. here. So if you increase the activation energy, okay, you can clearly see that this becomes a bigger negative number, okay, and e, a log to a negative number is less than 1, okay, and a smaller number less than 1 times A becomes a smaller K. So you increase EA going this way on our graphs, less molecules have the energy to uh, react, and my friends in chemistry, we will have a lower K. If you increase the temperature and make this fraction bigger, okay, then you're going to make this actually a positive value, okay, to some extent, and the increase in temperature will um, increase K and move as we've seen here, this forward, meaning more molecules, and, and K increases because of that. All right. Now, another way to look at it, if we do the natural log of both sides to get rid of that E, we get lin of K and rearrange. So if we take the natural log of both sides, we get lin of K equals A times uh, this expression coming out, because the lin of this E is just this expression. So I take the natural log of both sides, and what I get, party people, oh, going backwards, Okay, I get lin of k, this comes out, E negative EA over R, 1 over T equals the lin of A. The lin of A, of course, is the um, frequency factor, or what k would be if every molecule had enough energy. So, again, I increase A, this becomes a bigger negative value that drives this value down. So, EA increases, boom, k decreases, increase the temperature, okay, and what it will do is make this value become larger, okay, and add to A, well, at least become a bigger value. This number makes, well, actually what it will do is it will make this a bigger negative, it will make this negative number a smaller number, I should say. So this temperature increases, makes this whole thing become a smaller negative number, and therefore you approach uh, this lin of A and K increases because, of course, temperature increases, it moves forward. So it does explain those phenomena. But what's nice doing the lin of k and doing this rearranging, you get the y equals mx plus b again. And therefore you can actually plot using the lin of k over 1 over t, that's my slope, I'm sorry, that's my x, 1 over t, my slope is the negative slope, that negative value there, over r. And what's nice about this is you can actually solve for the activation energy using the slope of lin of k over 1 over t. And this, of course, is given to you in your reference tables as the Arrhenius equation that links, okay, uh, activation energy with temperature and how K changes. We now know as temperature increases, the rate of reaction increases because K increases. R equals K, kids, boys, dogs, girls, anyone thinking about going in between, okay? So let's go to your reference tables for a sec. Okay, so here we are in all of its glory, okay? There is our... Arrhenius equation, lin of k, y equals mx plus b, lin of a is your y-intercept, okay, and k changes, or on a slope of k, and again the slope. So I have never seen an AP question that actually uses this to solve for anything, but it's there if you need to. Most of the time they ask you to plot this, okay, in terms of a linear equation. They may ask you, as I'll show you, hey, what is the... Um, how do we solve for this for activation energy? Well, they'll ask you how activation energy and temperature affect each other. So I've never seen a calculation. We certainly could do that if it had to and be prepared if you see an activation energy with temperature with K. But you should know this is mostly theory. How does K change? Why does the rate increase with temperature? Okay, there it is. Why does activation energy affect it? And if I want to solve for activation energy, all I need to do is find the slope of lin of K over 1 over T, and then that gives me... My, uh, my slope is negative EA over R, and I knowing what, what R is, I can solve 
easily my activation energy. Or given um, the activation energy and the temperature, okay, you certainly can solve for K as well. But certainly, we usually go after here. So that's how that's used. And there's a the slope of linear K over 1 over T. And the slope, of course, is negative EA over R. And you can calculate EA from the slope of the plot of linear K versus 1 over T, as we talked about. Okay, last little piece is, um, uh, is uh, catalysts. Uh, catalysts start a whole new series of reactions, as I talked about. And they actually create new reactions. Notice these little humps here, these are potential energy curves that we learned last year. Um, if you don't have a catalyst, oxygen, uh, O3 will react with O to make O2 and O2 in a slow reaction, in a direct reaction. It takes a tremendous amount of activation energy. Because there's so much activation energy for this to happen, you guessed it, the K okay, value all right, is where? Very small, which makes the rate almost non-existent. But if I have a catalyst who sets off a series of mechanisms that didn't result, okay, in this case our catalyst is, uh, well, I think it's O, where we reproduce it. In this case it's, it's CO, catalyzed reaction. Sometimes they don't write the catalyst. They write, sometimes they write the catalyst over the, um, the arrow here. But bottom line is this catalyst reaction created a couple steps and collectively the activation energies for these steps combined were lower than the single step and that's why we say that catalysts make a alternative pathway and because of the lower the lower activation energies in this potential energy curve the combined K of the reaction total process okay is going to be um, a lot lot higher which means the reaction goes forward better it's neat uh, activation energy and K are combined and it makes a lot of sense okay and uh, what else do I have here? We have, this is the direct relationship. K is 4.1 times 10 to the 5. Okay. Uh, R is equal to that large K. And, or is this the combined? I'm not sure what I'm looking at here. Um, but catalysts lower the activation energy. They find an alternate pathway. And, of course, we have a couple of different catalysts. We have homogeneous catalysts. That means the, the catalyst is in the same phase as others. And then we have heterogeneous catalysts. They're in a different phase, you know, one in a solid, one in a gas. But that's pretty much all we have. Now, I have one last thing to derive, and that's half-life. And I'll get to that probably tomorrow. I would like you to try the worksheets that I have on the website at this point and do that for work. Oops, I had brain freeze. I'm looking at these uh, EAs a little differently. So the one-step EA is 17.1 joules. A huge, huge, okay, compared to the other small pathways by the catalyst is given by the activation energies. So this big, large activation energy by the uncatalyzed re re reacts in a K, pretty darn big. But these combined little activation energies makes the Ks, look at orders of magnitude. That's, what, four zeros, 10,000 times, in this case, 100,000 times uh, uh, higher, okay, meaning the reaction is going to be much faster as these Ks increase because of the lower activation energies combined. Sorry, now we're done. Home and check your work there. Okay, thanks.